This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this month's uh, Leader Development Community of Interest. I am really pleased to be here. Um, our guest speaker today is Ms. Julie Erickson. She's going to speak to us on effective communications. Um, so if you guys haven't had the pleasure of meeting Julie yet, I encourage you to do so at Small Business Conference or JETC or come out to Seattle where she is and uh, and come see us. So Julie, um, and in the past, she has served uh, our nation through the Navy. Um, in addition to that, uh, she also holds an MBA. Um, and one of the things that I love about her the most is she is a continuous learner. <laughs> so she has also uh, presently gone back to school. Uh, she's working on a degree in biology, which I think is fantastic. Um, in addition to all of that in her spare time, she uh, is also the president and CEO of STEL, which uh, focuses you know, her passions along the lines of her MBA and biology on, uh, you know, the environment, sustainability, infrastructure, resiliency, energy, all those cool things. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to, you know, introduce anything else you want the, our audience to know about yourself and uh, to talk to us about communications today. Sounds great. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here as uh, these are always great events for me to um, learn and experience kind of what's going on in the world. So with that being said, I see there's about 20 of us, uh, if, if the chat room information is correct. Um, quickly, I don't know if you all have, Eric, I'm assuming they have access to the hand signal where they can raise their hands. Oh, you know what? Like I don't think don't. that they do, Julie. Not in okay. go-to meetings. Correct. All right. They can How about this? They can I see everybody. Oh, yeah. Can they can everybody that's Sorry. everybody that's from the Pacific Northwest, can you unmute for me? Okay, I got. Well, I'm unmuting because I was from. I'm born and raised in Idaho. I don't live there now, though. Okay, we'll we'll, take, we'll take you, Zach. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Anybody else that I can't see or that is listed here that needs to unmute so I can tell if you're from the PAC Northwest? Being Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, Utah, that region. Just a couple of us. Okay. How many people are unmute if you are from the Southeast? No one from the Southeast, nobody from Florida, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina. All right. How many are from the Southwest? Can you unmute if you're from the Southwest? All right, I see Jeff, you're from Florida, good deal. Joshua McClure, you're from Fort Worth? If Texas counts as uh, Southwest, right. yes. Good deal. Um, okay. And and the reason, oh, and I didn't ask who's from the Northeast. I saw uh, someone from Westchester a little bit, a little bit ago. I'm you if you're, yeah, Mr. Guzman, you're from uh, Westchester, correct? Eric, are you from the Northeast? Or San Antonio. San Antonio, okay. Right. Uh, Dave Guzman, uh, Chicago. All right, good deal. So the reason I'm asking that question is because there's always some fun stuff about the cultural differences and how we all communicate. Um, and I say that because I've, I grew up in Ohio uh, and then I joined the Navy and then that put me in California, well, Great Lakes, California, Yokosuka, Japan, and then back to California, to Naples, Italy, to Washington, D.C., to Swansboro, North Carolina, to the great Pac Northwest, i.e. Seattle. And each one of those places, there is a bit of a different way of communicating. Um, and maybe it's why I'm not such a great communicator. So I have had to learn a lot of things about how to communicate. And my example will be the Pac Northwest. Uh, we do something out here that I 
find very interesting. Um, and, I, and I see it in my kids, as well as um, when I first moved out here, my clients, which is we, we do suggestive talking. We're not very direct. Some people call it passive. It's not like passive aggressive. It's just kind of a passive way of asking for things. And usually the conversation I have with my daughter is, um, so Kai, are you asking me for something? Or are you hinting around and I'm supposed to guess what you want? And she just kind of gets frustrated with me because she's used to the pack Northwest of kind of going, so Jules, wouldn't it be great if, and I'm like, so Kai, do you want, you know, pizza for dinner? Is that what you're really trying to ask me? And she just kind of smiles and she's like, yes, I would like to have pizza for dinner. So we, we have a cultural thing out here and it, and it is that type of behavior where we're not very direct. And when I first moved out here, I had to learn that about my clients, um, especially like WashDOT uh, and some of the private industry clients that we work with is that I had to be a little more subtle and a little less direct, a little less DC, a little more uh, Seattle. And so when Carolyn's asked me to do this presentation in the past, I, I usually mention that kind of cultural difference and the issues around communicating. Um, Eddie, if you can go to the next slide. Great. Um, I would first ask you all to look at this cartoon on the right and see if anybody has any, or hopefully this will make you chuckle a bit because communicating is a two-way street. Um, and the nuances around it come around. Sometimes we think something, but we don't say it, or we're not clear, like, you no, know, on three, is when we're going to move the body not on two and a half not on three and a half <laughs> when i say three we're picking up you know and, and being that explicit and when we're not really explicit what happens is we end up not being very clear in what our expectations are um, from people that we're working with and and vice versa like we we also have a responsibility to ask the people that are trying to give us instruction that we understand what they're asking and what their expectations are. Because most people don't clarify expectations and being specific in what they want. Um, and this leads to a lot of communication issues. And really a part of learning how to communicate effectively is uh, understanding your audience, understanding kind of what's going on in your environment, having some situational awareness, the different mediums at which you can ask questions or give direction or provide feedback. Um, but there's also how, do you, how all this is done to avoid conflict issues, because uh, I know everybody on this phone loves conflict. It's like the best, right? We, we love seeing people get frustrated. <laughs> We love losing time and energy. We love dealing with hurt feelings, all of those wonderful things that come with probably a lot of miscommunication. Um, does anyone, is anyone, and by the way, I'm gonna be interactive. I am not gonna do this by myself. So my expectation is I'm gonna ask some questions and I'm hoping and expecting all of you or someone to be bold enough and have the courage to step up and uh, answer for me. So within, when, within this slide deck, we've got different examples here. Does anyone have an example of miscommunication that they would like to share? Come on, this is the leadership group. Susan. An, an example. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Great. Um, I, I, what immediately came to mind as you were describing this is when you are working with a team on a bid submittal and you feel like you're being very clear and concise, as it says here, with exactly what you need in order to meet the compliance and answer the mail of what's needed bid submittal. But then inadvertently, you always end up getting things back that don't meet the mark. And so you question was I not being clear in exactly what was needed and how do you know how do you clean it up to make sure that people know exactly what you need from them? 
so that you're being compliant. Yes, I would agree. Anyone else have an example? Okay. I think all mine are Eric? bad examples because I, I have a tendency to delegate without yes. a lot of specificity. And so my expectations aren't always laid out. And so then when the final product is delivered, it doesn't always meet my expectations. And that's my fault, not the person that's delivering. So I, I have found that my, my challenge is making sure that I delegate, but also communicate expectations you know, for uh, whatever I'm asking somebody to do. Yes, and that's that's probably why I've been counseled as the CEO when I first became the CEO of delegating and just kind of expecting people to figure stuff out um, and realizing that I was setting them up for failure. Um, and as a leader, leader, you don't want to do that right. That's the thing that we're all trying to avoid. I also find it interesting that now we have a generation uh, because the complexity of communicating is, is that you've got a range of audiences that you're dealing with, right? And my my younger staff, um, they need more explicit direction. And I kind of have to break my, what I call the Navy habit of just kind of dumping and running. Um, because in, in my experience in the military was just hit X. I don't care how you get to X, just get to X. If, but don't break any rules. You can bend rules, but don't break any rules. So I came with that kind of similar approach when I first started leading teams is that everybody kind of knew that they had lots of leeway um, to get to the end game, but really a lot of them were just scared, uh, fearful that they would do something wrong, um, fearful that they weren't gonna meet my expectations, you know, those type of like things that could have really, if I would have done the pre-planning work to really been specific in what I did or what my expectations were, they would have performed better. There would have been less anxiety, um, less concerns about doing the wrong thing, that type of anxiety, uh, and then encouraging more of an open dialogue. So Eric, I'm right there with you in regards to um, learning how to be more specific in my delegation as well as being more explicit uh explicit in my experience or my expectations okay um go ahead eddie and go to the next slide so julie uh larry typed in the chat he said he's got an example as well oh larry go ahead uh good morning good afternoon the example i have is that i had um at the time recently transitioned from the private sector to the government and it's clearly expected in the private sector that if the projects run out of money, you pretty much get it to a final point and stop work immediately. And I, you know, had have just recently joined the government. You know, the project manager had told me the same thing or had told me, hey, we've run out of money on this project. So I pretty much got it to a stopping point, got off the project. But his expectation was that I was supposed to have completed the design and it just, we weren't going to go to construction. Well, I, you know, just miscommunication in terms of, uh, like you said, the expectations. And I, when he was looking for that final product and I didn't have it, you know, I, I think there was some major disappointment on his part. But, um, you know, part of it was just where I had come from just recently and not knowing the, you know, language terminology and expectations. Oh, absolutely. Great, great example, Eric. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a lot of times what I find myself personally is maybe all of you can relate to this. You most of you have had a partner of of some sort in your personal life, and, and what you use in all these cases with your kids, with your um, your partner, with your business peers, your business leaders, all of those things. It's it's all the kind of the same thing, right? And, and one of the things that I usually end up in a disagreement with my partner about or a miscommunication is because I think I said it out loud. I didn't. <laughs> but I, I had this like, this is how things work. Why would I need to explain that? And he's looking at me going, you didn't say any of that. I'm like, 
And then I have to replay the conversation go, no, I said that in my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Carolyn. I said that in my head, but I didn't say it to my partner. Um, so with that being said, it's um in this slide, uh, most of you, if you've if you've attended attended a lot of business training or done any reading around businesses, most of you will know who Peter Drucker is. He's he's a well renowned author around business strategy and um, the different elements of running companies and so forth. And you'll see the quote down there. Um, only three things happen naturally in organizations, friction, confusion, and underperformance, right? And really a lot of the things that we're trying to accomplish either from our families, our teams, our corporations, our, our volunteer organizations and so forth, we could, if we became better communicators uh, and listeners goes with that communication, we could probably eliminate or at least lessen the amount of friction, confusion, and underperformance. Um, so one of the things that I've also tried to encourage in my own operation is um, trying to get everybody on the same page and a lot of the times I'm trying to clarify my direction and get all of my business units and all of my staff kind of headed in the same direction. And honestly, they're all different individuals, right? And how you do that and how you communicate to them, you kind of got to find the different ways that work for people. Um, but it's really important if you're going to implement strategy to clearly communicate how you want that done, right? Um, has anybody ever had an organization that just seemed to uh, run smoothly? Does anybody have an example of an organization that just runs smoothly all the time? I'm going to assume no, right? We all, all have issues communicating. We all run into roadblocks. We all we all run into situations where folks misheard what we thought we said and vice versa. Eddie, can you go to the next slide? So let's, let's talk about things that help do this um, or help communicate more effectively, things that we can be mindful of in regards to how we communicate. And a lot of people hear the, the term clear and concise. Be clear and concise when you communicate. Well, what does that mean? Um, because it can mean lots of different things. And one of my best examples is um, I had a fantastic archaeologist working for me. She had done curation. She, she had done multi-volume documents, you know, the whole nine yards. And she was also a project manager at times for me. And she used to send me dissertations. And it was very frustrating because I didn't have time to read them. They were well written, well thought out, level of detail was exceptional. And what I finally learned after going through multiple iterations of being frustrated with them was, Carrie, can you just tell me what you want? In the very first paragraph, I need, I need to know the whole bottom line up front. I, this is all great information, but I really need to know what you're specifically asking me for. And, and if I can't answer it in the first line, I will. I have the ability to read through the rest, but I really need you to get to the point. Um, and sometimes I think that is a, a, some people find it frustrating that you don't want all that information. Because Terry's point was, but Julie, you need all this information. I'm like, nah, I only need about 20% of this information. So my, my reasoning was I only have so much time in a day. And not only do I have Terry, I have 60 to 150 other employees that are also sending me these types of emails. So how do I instruct them about my expectation of give me the bottom line up front? T tell me what you specifically wanted to know and what type of priority and when you want to know it by so that I can respond appropriately. Um, and I think that's where clear, 
clear and concise is being deliberate with your words. Um, a lot of times we write things as we're thinking them through and not necessarily going back to edit them to ensure that the expectations have been clarified, um, that I've said it succinctly um, or concisely and using the proper grammar. You know, one of the questions I'll, I'll get asked routinely is, hey, Julie, what's your gross margin? Or what's your what's your margin or what's your profit? And I usually now go back and go, so that's a word that means several things. Are you talking about profit? Are you talking about EBITDA? Um, what is it that you are really asking me for? And maybe give me a sentence as to why you need that information so that I have some context. So those those are ways that we can help each other um, kind of work through that concisiveness. Because some people will say puppy because it's one word. Some people will say small dog because they have a word count and they need more words. Um, those type of things will help facilitate, you know, getting to the point of what it is that you really want to know. Um, let's see your uh, grammatical sentences that are really long. It's, it's almost like you have to play a game with yourself of how do I say this in seven words? Or how do I say this in two sentences versus a paragraph? And, and really thinking about how to kind of whittle out the nonsense, right? Or the, the things that are more suggestive versus direct. Um, and I, I saw somebody say, yeah, I'm, 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 that's totally me on email. Most people know that my emails are pretty cut and dry. Uh, to the point that sometimes I apologize for them because I'm like, I'm not being unfriendly. I, it's just, but it's an email. Um, if you want to have a conversation about it, call me. But on an email, I have X amount of emails a day. So do you. I, I really don't want to get into conversations in email because one, it's hard to document it or it's, it's you're, you're losing efficiency in that conversation versus just having a phone call. And so those are also kind of the things that you've got to be uh, concerned about. And even right now, I'm probably being wordy, but in my slide, I'm being very concise. So Eddie, can you skip to the next slide? Expectations. All right. Okay, so we've touched on this a little bit. Um, again, this comes back to what's in your head and what did you actually say? Um, one of the things that you may get feedback from your subordinates is they just didn't understand. They didn't know that that's what you're, what you really wanted. And I think this is more and more important because a lot of us in the leadership roles, we are now mentoring and coaching in ways that weren't necessarily given to us. You know, um, the, the generation behind us, they've gone through an education system that's very much carrots, not sticks. It's much more prescriptive versus open-ended. And so it's really upon us to give the expectation of what we really want from somebody. And I think I gave this in my last presentation. Um, and I'll, and I'll make it personal versus business because it's less, less conflict that way. Um, but my, we have a 15 year old and she likes to do a load of laundry. That's all of her clothes. That's it. And I, I get irritated by this on occasion um, for multiple reasons. And so the other day she had left everything in the dryer and didn't fold it or she or she does things like she'll pull everything out of the dryer stick it on the couch and expect everybody else to fold it and so the other day i went and i said hey kalia can you um can you fold all the laundry in the um in the dryer for me and she's like yeah sure and so that was all i was like cool she said yes that that did not take a lot of fighting there and i was very specific and that i wanted her to fold the laundry about two hours later, I came back and still wasn't done. Now you can tell from my expectation that I expected it to be done in the next two hours. I never said that to Kalia. So who's wrong, me or Kalia? 
Anybody have a, an opinion? Well, the mother in me <laughs> says she's wrong, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> I, I do the same thing. Yeah, I, I've noticed that with um, with time, um, you have to be really specific or, you know, sometime this week, like to me, that's okay. This week, the business, you know, weekends Friday, that's tomorrow. But other people that could be Saturday, that could be Sunday, you know, yeah. Right. So imagine if you do that to an employee. Right. And I think that's one of the other things that I have some great, I, I, I am fortunate, I have great employees and they have all managed me at some point and said, so that's great, Julie, when do you wanna buy? Or Julie, what kind of priority is this? Cause I got 10 other priorities. And that's a fair question in my opinion. Um, so I've gotten much better at giving them more expectations, more clear, direction of time frames, higher priority, lower priority, um, because that comes back to that confusion and friction uh, and underperformance that Mr. Drucker, Drucker is talking about, is if I don't give clear guidance and maybe even an expectation or even context, I am kind of setting them up for failure. Um, so I try to be much more specific about that. Uh, Lori, great. Lori uh, posted in the chat, my pet peeve is unclear use of the subject line when there are numerous email replies or changing the subject line. <laughs> yeah, that's that's another way to set people up for failure or confuse them and waste a lot of time going back through 20 emails going, wait a minute, what happened here? I was having a conversation about X. How did we get on the conversation about Z? And now all of my emails don't string together. Yes. Be, be very careful on those things uh, as you do them because it will create more confusion and complexity in a situation that really didn't need to have it. Um, let me see here, what was my other note about expectations? No, that's, that's it. It's, it's really, did you actually say what you were thinking and what your expectations were? Um, And why, why would, why anybody's opinion, this is an opinion question, why would we not say our expectations out loud or be direct? What's the, what, why, why wouldn't we do that? Anybody have a thought on that? I think it's good to give people some creative freedom in the professional scenario to not give them clear expectations to see how they can navigate through a project or navigate and maybe find a, a better way to do something that we didn't weren't already doing. Yeah, that's usually my response is, you might be able to do it better than me, so why would I tell you exactly how to do it? That's not gonna help me expand the capable possibilities of what we could do here. Yes, sometimes I leave out direction, or at least that's what I'm, I gotta find a better way to say it though, but it's it's leaving leaving people the option to find their own path, which works for some folks and doesn't work for other folks. Any other uh, ideas as to why we don't express our expectations or we are not very direct in what we're asking for? Tom, keep them guessing. <laughs> Oftentimes, I think it probably comes down to we don't always know what the expectations are or don't want to take the time to, to figure it out and convey it. Absolutely. Um, being afraid of my, my, there's what you're saying, which is I may not know exactly because maybe you're not getting clear direction or you're not there yet to the point that you know, you just know that you're following some instinct to go a certain direction. Um, but I also find it, sometimes I get worried about setting expectations or being direct, especially with clients, because what if I irritate them? What, what if they don't wanna work with me anymore because I've been direct and expressive of what my expectation is? What's gonna be the consequence of that? So there, there's a fear mindset that you can get tied into here as well, which is a limiting, when you come from a place of fear, it's limiting, right? Um, 
Whereas if you come from a place of just trying to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that you're trying to um, avoid conflict in a positive way, right? You're, you're trying to set the, the ground rules and get everybody to the same place. Um, but sometimes our fear or concerns of doing that is going to create conflict in a different way or that people are going to be uncomfortable because we're setting expectations. Um, that's, that's another reason people don't always express them. Um, because I, I know in my experience or yeah, my experience is that sometimes you set expectations and people are like, oh, she set me up to be accountable. I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, because that's a part of holding people accountable is having all of this clearly laid out to then be able to go back and say, hey, I, I know I asked for this two days ago. Is, is there a reason that we're being held up here? Unless you didn't tell them and then it's on you. I mean, that's when, when you're being accountable for the fact that you didn't clearly ask. So that's, that's part of, these are all good reasons that sometimes why we don't set expectations or we're not clear about our, our um, request. Hey, Julie, this is Carolyn. Just uh, two comments, one on the holding people accountable. I mean, there's also something very empowering about it, you know, as yeah. the person who's being held accountable, like uh, I'm responsible for something and that can be incredibly empowering when it's communicated the right way. And then the other thing on expectations and your example of the client and, you know, am I being too direct? Do they think I'm unfriendly because I'm so direct, that kind of thing. I mean, obviously there's contractual expectations that are written and are extremely clear, but I have found that when I don't have that conversation with the client, especially in the beginning, oftentimes there are unwritten expectations and um, it doesn't affect the end deliverable, but maybe how they would like to see it done. Um, sometimes contractually we can flex into it and it's no problem sometimes it's a bigger problem and we have to have that discussion as to why but it I have found in the past that it's always better to have that conversation with a client than to not have it with the client yeah um, and, and it's interesting because I have a uh, we have a project right now that there's like at least 30 stakeholders and it's it's an agency that's never had to do this type of work before and they're asking us for how to do it. And we're like, well, this is this is how we typically do it, but what's your expectation? And they just sit there and just get really quiet because they're just unsure. And I think they're afraid of maybe asking us to do something that may be the wrong thing to ask us to do. So it's funny because from the client's perspective, we, we as consultants hold them accountable to the contract terms and conditions but if there's vagueness there, sometimes we all like vagueness because it gives us options. And sometimes we don't like vagueness because then the client can come back and go, well, I thought that was a reasonable request. No, it, it's really not, but there's no definition around it, right? There's no way to hold them accountable. There's no way to hold us accountable. You can end up in these, that, that's where I think the biggest conflicts come from is that there's a lack of boundaries or determination of what is the expectation, what is the intent of this workload, what am I trying to get to? Um, I think it's really important that we, we talk about it, but accountable equal is also trust. That's, that's my follow on to the accountable part is really you're trying to demonstrate trust in people by saying, hey, this is what I'm asking for and I trust you to deliver. Um, so that's, that is kind of the empowerment I think that you're talking about, Carolyn. Exactly. Uh, Eddie, can you move to the, the next slide, please? Oh, getting what you need. Okay, so we, we've kind of, I, I'm leading into getting what we need. Go ahead, uh, Eddie, and you can, oh, wait, don't, don't flip yet. So what have we heard so far? in regards to getting what we need. What do we need to do? Anyone? Concise and clear. Yeah, concise and clear. Set expectations. Set expectations. 
And timing. Timing. Uh, no in our audience. Okay, good, good stuff. Um, one of the, I've got this great example um, that's gonna lead into this, this slide area. So I'm sure everybody's had an experience where an invoice has been rejected. Anybody not had an invoice be rejected for some reason? Okay, so you're all just as flawed as I am. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. So, so I have a, I had a project manager forward me an email in regards to rejecting an invoice. And I read the email, I was like, huh, that's interesting. And I went back to the project manager. I said, what, what is this? What happened here? And she's like, well, I don't know, but I'm a little irritated about the snarkiness of her email. And so the person who, who had, had um, submitted the rejection kind of added a lot of blame and shame and judgment. Like you could feel it coming through the email, or at least we could. Uh, I, I'm not sure that was the sender's intent, but I'm pretty sure in that, in the context of that um, initial rejection, we were accused of falsifying timesheets. We were accused of um, poor performance and running them over budget. So obviously my project manager sent it to the CEO and said, hey, fix this. And I just chuckled and I said, all right. Um, so I, I read through it again and I thought about where this person, what they were trying to actually ask me for because my response was we don't falsify timesheets ever we're federal contractors i'll i'll get debarred if, if we do that kind of thing and poor performance i haven't heard anybody say that we have done anything wrong so this is my first notification that we are not performing so that's interesting so i need to figure that out um and then i hear that there's a budget constraint and that we have exceeded their budget so um, me being me, I, I went back to the, uh, the project manager. I said, you know, from what I can understand in this email, it sounds like you think we falsified timesheets that we uh, didn't perform successfully. And that, that has both caused you a budget constraint or an overrun. Um, and I think, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but I, I said, first, we, we don't, falsified timesheets, and I've already inquired and confirmed that we have not, uh, that I have not heard of any performance issues, and neither has my project manager, and we have no correspondence to the fact, uh, so therefore the invoice stands. That took about a week, and then she responded with, and by the way, I'm not perfect. You all could have handled this totally different, but that was kind of my perspective on the situation. She came back a week later. Oh, and I and I had, I said it sounds like there's a miscommunication here. Um, and really, what my project manager had said is, no, we had five different phone calls about putting a drum on site, and we we did that. I'm like, so so we met the obligation. We didn't do anything wrong. We we didn't screw something up. There was no negative feedback. I asked all those questions before I sent the email, and and did my due diligence. Um, and so about a week later, I got a response back, which is, which was kind of snarky as well, which is there's huge errors here, uh, in our communication and she put, she put it back on us. And, and so I, I read through the, the discourse and really what I found at the end of the day was she didn't understand why the invoice was greater than normal, but she never asked that. She pointed a lot of things that would make me think, wow, we really screwed something up. And so I, I called the PM, RPM again. I said, so let me understand what happened that increased our invoice from normal conditions. And she's like, well, the client changed the, the type of process. I said, what do you mean? 
well, we used to do this and they changed it to a vacuum process, which required us to get a drum and it's COVID. So we couldn't just go get a drum because there was delays and, you know, getting a truck, doing this and doing that, which then created an additional cost. Da, 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 da. And I said, so this is a one-time thing? Yes. Okay, so the change of process increased the invoice amount. Do we submit a monthly report with these invoices? No. Does the, their PM know that you ran into all these issues? Well, they were fine with everything. I said, but it sounds like we didn't communicate and they didn't communicate. Now we have an unhappy client because it looks like we're invoicing more than normal. But really at the end of the day, there was a change of process and it's exceeding their budget, which is what she's really dealing with is there's more costs here than she was anticipating, but no one's, no one's talking about the change of process that got us here. So I think that's, that's where I'm gonna lead into this next slide, which is really learning um, a type of communication skill that I have, I have found very effective. Um, Eddie, if you can, can you flip to the next slide? So has anyone ever heard of nonviolent communication or compassionate communication? Okay, it's a quiet audience. Roland, have you heard of it? Nope. So I learned about non nonviolent communication a couple of years ago. And uh, how did I learn about it? Oh, I was probably going through marriage counseling or something like that, right? I was, I was, I was learning that I wasn't the best communicator and how to get better at it. And so nonviolent communication um, was, you know, originated by Marshall Rosenberg. There's lots of books. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tom. And, and funny enough, Tom, the reason this came up and I had to go look into this is I was on a conversation in a conversation and somebody said, that's a you're bi you're violently communicating, Julie. I'm like, I'm what? <laughs> I'm not a violent person. At least last time I checked, I wasn't. He's like, no, you're you're not explaining exactly what you need from me. And you're kind of blaming and and telling me something, but you're not telling me what you need. I'm like, oh, I'm making it about you and I'm not I'm not taking any ownership here or understanding that I'm not being clear in what I'm asking for. And so that's the violent communication is, is really kind of setting somebody up for failure or putting it on them, the responsibility on them, when really you're the person who hasn't um, identified what you need and clearly communicated that. Um, because one is more respectful. And, and I'm sure that all of you, if, if you think through conversations you've had personally and professionally, you'll find many conversations that you've had where you felt like you were being blamed for something, yet you're sitting there going, but I don't know what I did wrong. And a lot of times it's really on the person who has the issue of not clearly communicating what they needed. I'm not gonna say it's all the time, but the example here I think is pretty, pretty well, first of all, it's entertaining. Second of all, I think we've all been there, which is uh, the example in the upper right-hand corner, right? Four basic steps in nonviolent communication. Observe the situation without evaluation, blame, or moralistic judgment. Um, identifying the feeling that the situation brings up. A lot of times we, we feel it in our gut, in our heart, whatever you want to call that feeling, where we either get defensive and defensiveness can come from the fact that we know we're wrong and we feel the need to defend, or we're sitting there going, I had no clue that I had done anything wrong, all right? There's, there's this kind of natural response that you feel. Sometimes it's a, it's a visceral feeling of, of getting irritated because you're being blamed for something that you're like, I didn't do this. But all of those are kind of signs of the miscommunication that's happening. Um, and so identifying the feelings that the situation brings up, digging deeper to identify what need is or is not being met by either you or the other party, right? And then requesting actions that would better meet your needs. 
so this is kind of like Kai and I. Kai, do you really want pizza? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Because otherwise, you're just expecting me to guess what you want. And there could be a billion things with red sauce and cheese. I don't know which one you're really asking me for. And I don't want her to be upset. And I don't want to be upset if I don't get her pizza when that's really what she wanted, right? So figuring out what the person's really asking you for. Um, you've got to listen. You got to think through what they're, you got to slow down, right? A lot of this requires you to slow down. Um, so observation, the example. I found dirty clothes on the floor of the bedroom. I'm frustrated because I know I clean the bedroom most of the time. Um, need, because I need an orderly living space, right? I'm, I am one of those people who likes clean spaces where everything's put away and everything has a place and I know where it's at. I am one of those people. Call it OCD, whatever you want to call it. Um, request, would you be willing to put your clothes in the hamper when you take them off? That's much more specific. Um, and it's expressing what your need is, not blaming the other person for being less organized than you are, but really explaining to them that's what you need to feel okay, right? To not be frustrated. Because a lot of times if we express what's going to create a more harmonious environment by asking for it versus blaming, we will get the result we want. Has anybody experienced this? Anybody have any examples to share? I'm reading comments since nobody's speaking up yet. Hey, Julie, um, this is uh, this is Roland. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, Roland. Yeah. So. Um, I have this issue with my kids all the time. Um, I tell them something that's intended to be uh, constructive criticism, um, and they they feel like it's not a nonviolent bit of communication. <laughs> uh, and we're still we're still struggling with it. Hey, no, this isn't meant to be scolding you. I'm just telling you that you missed that thing or you forgot to do whatever um pick a chore and um we're trying to get to the point where we recognize that every bit of criticism is not a bit of scolding or a bit of violent communication right right um i i know for me it's it's a mindset shift i had to go through of because even, you know, my, my girls are not my girls, right? I inherited my girls. Uh, and it's been a process for the last couple of years because I am different, as they like to say. Um, and a lot of it is, uh, was it Kai came home yesterday and wants her dad to sign a, uh, you know, one of your typical school documents that says, hey, she's going to do road, uh, what's it called? Crosswalk guard. And she's going to, she's going to be there for a week to do that. And so she's kind of being adamant with Matt about doing it. And I just kind of looked at her and said, so Kai, let's think through this. You have four people you're asking to help you do this. And she looked at me and she's like, how so? I said, because if your dad can't pick you up, then I've got to pick you up. And if I can't pick you up, you're expecting your older sister to pick you up. And if she can't pick you up, then you're expecting your mom to pick you up. And I said, and there's consequences to this. It's not that we don't want you to do this, but it's more than just one thing, right? And so, and I'm not saying, I'm not making a call on anything. I just, for me, it's become trying to express to the kids more specifically as to why uh, and the need. Like if, if you do this, that allows these things to happen. But if you don't do it, it allows these things to happen. And what is the option that you want to go with here? So parenting is a never ender battle. God bless us all for who do it um, and don't and watch. Um, but I think that's, it, it is a, this skill was something I had to practice. I still have to practice. I still have to check myself and go, all right, what do I need to own here before I start getting into somebody else's business. 
because I probably own something in this situation um, because communication is a two-way street. Any other examples? Thank you, Roland. That was awesome. I appreciate that. Any work examples where this would have benefited you? I can finish my example, which is I got the uh, response to my email and it was like, yes, there is a miscommunication here. And really at the end of the day, she, to paraphrase her email was, we don't have the money to do this. And so I responded with, all right, I think we do have a miscommunication here because the, the change in process is what caused the invoice increase. And we did communicate with your PM who never expressed to us any desire to do anything differently than what we were doing. Um, and to meet you in the middle, we will, we will eat the time and expense of getting the drum, we'll get this, and we'll eat half the cost and, and reduce the invoice. And that helped her meet her budget constraint because that's really what she was asking for at the end of the day. So it was kind of that observing, understanding, identifying, and, ex and hearing her request. Um, Eddie, can you go to the next slide? Sure. Hey, Julia, I, I did have a work example that might be uh, relevant to this because it's something that didn't end up getting resolved, but now is going to get resolved with the new database. It's um, related to our, our, our member database. When I came in, I was a, a program person trying to now uh, get data from our member database that people hadn't really needed to access before. And we started realizing that our database was not the best in outputting certain types of information. Uh, I'm a program person. I didn't really know the ins and outs of our database infrastructure. So we kept, I kept finding myself in a miscommunication scenario where I kept asking what I needed, but what they wanted was me to just instruct them, I need a report with this, this, and this. And I kept okay. saying, well, I don't really know what is in there. So this is the type of uh, data I'm trying to get. You know, I need you to tell me how to request it. And she would look at me the other way going, well, I don't really know, you know, just, just tell me what you want and I'll get it for you. So we kept going into this cycle of, I didn't know enough about the infrastructure to ask the right question. And she wasn't thinking about what I actually needed, uh, you know, versus turning it just into a transactional request. Right. Um, now that we're migrating to a new database, we're, we've been able to start from scratch and we've started with, here's what I need the new database to do. And now that's being built into the infrastructure, but we just could not get past that miscommunication between what I needed from the database <clears throat> and what they thought the database could do. Yeah, because it almost sounds like no one knew what the end game was. That wasn't being communicated, right? What the, what the, out, the ultimate outcome or expectation was. And so there was a lot of um, spinning in the process because yeah, this, just... it's yeah that they they never were going to be put in, in a position of answering the kind of questions that I was wanting to answer. So it was never occurring to them how to set up the database to get those answers. Yeah, you know, so uh, well, it, a perfect example because it, it, it yeah you're going to end up in a do loop, right? You're just going to keep asking, and they're going to keep going. What do you need? And, you, and it's just both of you have good intentions. You just yeah. can't get there. Yeah. Thank you, Eddie. All right, forms of communication. Uh, okay, Let's go ahead and click to the next one. Uh, we all know the forms of communication. I mean, you got social media, you got email, you got telephones, you got in person, you got uh, virtual at this point. I mean, boy, do we have lots of options. Boy, do we have lots of options. And ideally, you're going to pick the one that best allows you to be clear, conc clear, concise, um, and express what you need, right? So you just got to work through, think through those things, because you may want to use an email, but that email may take, could be eliminated. You could eliminate 20 emails with a five-minute phone call, 
which one's more valuable to you? Because to me, my time's the most valuable thing for me. Um, so what's going to get there the fastest with the least amount of conflict and performance results that I'm looking for? So think through those uh, as you do. Um, we're all getting used to this virtual community, right? I find that as much as I want to have video on, sometimes bandwidth doesn't let me do that, especially when there's 21 participants. My, my internet's going to crash. So I've got to find a way to make this interactive. And that's the setting out the expectation up front. I am going to ask you all to participate because otherwise, I know that all of you are on mute and you're doing emails because I am just as guilty. <laughs> so you got you to work through these different types of communications and how much attention you want somebody to be provided, the efficiency, therefore, you know, what's going to give you the best result um, that you can. Eddie, if you can pick, click to the next slide. So here's the pros and cons. Just in summary, uh, or a free summary here, and you know, it's it's funny is the 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 pro and cons. You know, which which one do you want to deal with? That's the other thing you got to think through. Um, most of you have been in the military and have heard the kind of go slow to go fast. You know, do the setup, do the do the right type of communication, get everything clearly laid out so that you don't have to backtrack. So that's really what you're trying to avoid. Backtracking, hurt feelings, confusion, friction, all those type of things. Um, and then eliminating as much noise in the process that you can. Uh, I don't know if most of you remember those wonderful, very complex uh, test questions that throw in a lot of BS, as I like to call it. Uh, from like PMP exams and college exams where they throw all of this information at you. Some of it matters, some of it doesn't. And so you have to really discern what matters and what doesn't. That's a, that is a positive of the process is that you can eliminate noise in the front end so you're not dealing with it in the back end and, and having to make course corrections and such in the back end. Um, less politics, uh, decreasing uh, confusion, getting the organization to move forward or the team to move in the same direction versus somebody who's totally lost is like holding up the show because they just don't understand what the, what the plan is, right? It's, it's our job as leaders to really kind of lay out the framework and make sure that everybody understands what is going on. Um, the cons, and, and I am, I have been referred to as charmingly abrasive. I like to say that I'm assertive, um, but it can be that you're seen as being curt and short, a lack of sense of humor, too direct, you know, the list goes on, but which do you want? Do you want to be everybody's favorite person or do you want to make sure that your team is set up for success? Um, that's one way of looking at this. Eddie, go ahead to the next slide. Hey, Julie, I just want to do a time check. We're getting close. Oh, that's to what I'm like, this is the last slide. Perfect. Sorry. Yep. So a quick summary, know your audience, know your organization's culture and what you're trying to foster in that culture. Leverage the principles of com compassionate communication, i.e. nonviolent. There's plenty of books on it. It's they're eye opening once you kind of start leveraging them uh, in what you do and how you do it. Uh, Make sure that you're expressing your intent using simple um, sentence structures and so forth. That usually helps and try to avoid jargon. I get called on jargon, as I'm sure a lot of you do in our industry. When we have somebody new come in, they're like, what, what is an FCL? Well, don't, don't assume that everybody knows what it is. Um, choose a communication channel based on your audience intent and what works best for those recipients. And that is something that you kind of have to learn as well as you go. You'll you'll try stuff and it'll work and other stuff won't work. So um, end of the hour, any questions for me? Hopefully this has been useful to all of you. Does anybody have questions for Julie? 
my favorite is that observe, feel, you know, need, request um, model. It, it does work very well uh, personally yeah. and professionally. So I, I encourage you all to give it a try. Yeah, I, I've seen very, very good results with it in the last yeah. few years. Yep. Okay, well, I don't see anybody else unmuting, but um, I appreciate you all participating um, and Julie being very clear in her expectations for all of us to participate, <laughs> um, as well as the engagement in the chat, guys. Um, and Julie, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you joining us today. Oh, I, I, my pleasure. Thank you all for being good participants. All right. Well, I hope you guys have a good rest of your afternoon and we will see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great one. Bye. Thanks, Julie. Bye.